Was that awesome what Jerry shared? Oh my goodness. I mean, we, in my opinion, we had church. And he was right on. You know, we must wake up. We must arise and shine. <laughs> but we need to know who we are in Christ and who he is in us. And yes, in all things, walk in love. We do take... We're, I believe shallow, many of us shallow Christians, because we, we multitask when we're supposed to be worshiping. We multitask when we're supposed to be in the word. You know, I am guilty of that, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> My daughter now works midnights, so she gets home when I'm getting up. <clears throat> and, of course, she, that's her time that she can talk because then she sleeps during the day. And she knows I study till like, 10 o'clock in the morning. Don't disturb me. And then there's things that happen, and I'm like, so do I answer, do I not answer? So it's like I have to really reinforce what the Lord has said to me. I want your time alone without other things, without distractions. So my daughter has to go to sleep and <laughs> call me on the way to work in the evening. So, you know, it's, it's a sacrifice. Are we willing to give up something you know, to spend that time with the Lord, because we really need that time with him. It, there's just no words to explain, right? I mean, it's just without measure what he can do in your life when you're willing to give your life, your time to him, okay? He's really revealing what I would say mysteries to those who are listening, to those who have an ear to hear, we are going to hear, we're going to receive. So, well, I didn't plan on saying a whole lot, but um, I do want to say before we ask the gentleman to come up, um, this is Purim. And of course, this is when we honor what Esther did for the Jewish people. And, you know, she's really a picture of the bride, and you guys can definitely add to this, but she's really a picture of the bride today, and uh, Mordecai, her uncle, as like Holy Spirit, and we are interceding like she did, for she interceded for a nation, right? She put everything, she knew her life was on, you know, in danger if she was found out that she was a Jew, but it didn't matter Today, our life is in danger if we, people know we're a Christian, right? So that's okay. Are we willing to walk that extra mile? Are we willing to be a bold witness for the one who gave everything for us? So, you know, today we need to be interceding for those that are lost. We talked a lot about that this weekend. For those who are lost, you know, we really need to be praying for them because... They don't even know that they're lost. Can you remember when you were lost? You'd make a lot of excuses. Even when you knew you was doing something wrong, it's like, well, there's always tomorrow. Well, maybe there's not. Okay? God knows, and he's the only one that knows, what day he's taking you home, what day and what hour. But we have a responsibility to pray for those who are lost. Okay? Think about all the children out there that are trafficked, kidnapped that breaks my heart you know I, I therefore I didn't even want to look at a milk carton because they had a child's face on it you know and and I would I would weep over that and I would pray about that Lord you know what if it was my child or my now my grandchild what would I do so you know we really need to be praying for those who are lost because one person like people that are with abortion clinics just think about that those doctors and nurses that are involved in that, if they were saved, what a difference that one person would make. How many lives would be saved, right? So, okay, well, let me welcome Bobby Connor. Everybody knows Bobby. <laughs> Bobby is a regular here. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a seat. Okay. But do, you want, do you want to talk here first? Before yeah, you... let, let me tell him. Just to... Here's Bobby. Good. God bless you, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Uh, 
I like when God shows up and shows off, don't you? Uh, we, can't, we can't keep talking about a God we can't prove. Now, here's what happened. This is February the 17th. Say it, February 17th. I'm up there in Golden, Colorado doing a conference, and I'm in a hotel room, wake up that morning, and I'm still laying uh, in the bed with my uh, head on a pillow, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to talk to your people about today? And he said, I want you to tell them, uh, to, to teach them to hear my voice. Okay. I said, okay, what verse do you want me to use? So I got up out of bed, sat down at the table. He, I said, what verse do you want me to use? Psalms 29. I said, okay. So I turned to Psalms chapter 29. And here's what it says. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty one. Ascribe to the Lord uh, glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness in holy array. Here it is. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Now watch this. Don't lie in church. The moment he said, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters, a spring of water shot up in my Bible. What? A spring of water shot up in my Bible. Just like that. I, go, I grabbed me a, a napkin. I'm trying to, uh, it was crumpling up my pages. A spring of water jumped up. Okay. So I thought, that's wild. So I'm in Morningstar in their prophetic round table. Oh, you know, the prophetic round table they have every year. So I'm there, and uh, the, there's a whole bunch of prophetic voices there. And uh, the one said, uh, uh, Steve Strang was sitting beside me there, the guy that does Charisma Magazine. Anyway, the Lord said, tell him about the water. So I said, uh, I got something to say. Uh, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. And I told the story about what I just told you. So help me, God, guess what happened? Water began to pour out upon me. Uh, I, boom. Oh, Steve Strang. He goes, uh, you know. Listen, God wants to show up and show off. Water is a type of the word. And the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. And I'm telling you, that's pretty wild, isn't it? I mean, water began to just, I mean, listen, that, that, that got their attention. You know, because a lot of times the prophets are going, oh, thus saith the Lord unto thee. Hey! God wants to demonstrate who he is. And so if you're going to study about the voice of God, do, do Psalms to, uh, 30 and, and says the voice of the Lord is up on the water. It's the voice of the Lord. Is, and we need to hear more about his voice. The Bible said, my sheep hear my John 10, 10, John 10, 3 said, my sheep hear my voice. John 10, 27 said, they'll flee from other voices because they don't know it. You better watch out who you're listening to. There's some goofy, crazy stuff out there. If it doesn't line up with that Bible, I don't care how winsome the person is, leave it alone. Listen, it's leading you down a pathway. We need the Word of God, and we need people that will teach the Word of God. And I, I like that it's, it's, it's high time to quit playing around. This is serious business, but water just poured down, splashing all over, saying, I, I like that when God shows up like that, don't you? Now, you couldn't have somebody up there at the water hose going, here, Bobby. There's enough fakes going around, uh, but God wants to do something genuine. Where our, I'll tell you what's missing in the body of Christ, the holy awe of God. I mean, God's going to show up, and the biggest word across the body of Christ, guess what it's going to be? Awestruck. Awestruck. Our, our mouths will gape open. I said, God, give me an example of awestruck. John the Revelator, biggest buddy Jesus had. But he got reintroduced to the resurrected Redeemer. What does he do? Does he go, hey, dude, want to hang with you? No, the Bible said he fell as though he was dead. See, we're, we're, listen, that's coming. Where God moves into such a, a room and everyone on our face. We're on our face. I'll tell you, the fear of the Lord is wonderful. You can't get wisdom without fear. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. We need the holy reverential fear of God. Now, you might say, you yeah, one thing, brother. I ain't afraid of God. Well, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm more afraid of God than I am the devil. See, I can rebuke the devil. It, did you read the Bible? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The Lord told me to tell you he's not near as easy to get along with as some preachers have made him out to be. 
It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Don't you ever let anybody say, well, now God knows that we're human and he knows that we're frail and, and uh, you know, you can just go ahead and sin and God will forgive you. No, he won't. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of sin, there remains no more sacrifice for that sin but a fearful looking of fiery indignation which shall deliver the adversary. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to tell about the water. We water, don't we? Oh, Lord, let the rivers come. Let the waters. And I thank you, God, that your, your word really is a, a water to our soul. And, Lord, you said, as a little desert deer pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O oh God. I thirst for you like in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Let's get desperate for God, okay? And let's, let's become who God says we are. Unstoppable. <laughs> Good. Okay. Bobby is unstoppable. Is he awesome or what? <laughs> I wish I was in that meeting. Can we move that back a little bit? Yeah, scoot it back. Okay, Etienne, do you want to come up? And maybe you'd like to share a little bit before. Because <laughs> we're going to do a little panel. How's that? But we need room to sit here. Where do you want us? Just you sit wherever you want. I'll, t- sitting away. I'll, I'll sit in Okay, I was, I guess I am. Now, I was thinking about this, and I don't mean this unkind. Earlier, I was thinking, well, I'll sit in the middle, and I'll be the rose between two thorns. And I thought, well, that would be not nice. But then, <laughs> but then, <laughs> but it, it is, because you know what? They, these guys bring a, a prickly word, okay? And that's a compliment, because they prick your spirit, okay? Pierce it. That's what Bobby just did. I'm sorry? (laughs) (laughughs) Well, you pierced the darkness. (laughs) So, anyhow, so I'll be the rose. You can be the cactus, whatever. But, uh, yeah. But, you know, think about that. The thorns. Jesus had the thorns on on his head, didn't he? All right? So it's really piercing that darkness. And they bring an awesome word that, you know, we need to hear. And before I go any farther, I want to say thank you, volunteers. We just completed our conference last night, and all of you, thank you, yes. We could never pull it off without the men and women who assist here. I mean, they are awesome people. In the parking lot, parking people, security, seating us, you know, just everything, everybody. I love this place because it is family. It's family to me, and we all work together, and we need that. So, okay. Bobby shared something I did. Etienne, how about if you share something before we begin a Q&A? You guys like Q&A? Yes. Okay, well, we're going to do that, but I want Etienne to share whatever's on your heart for now. Okay. Morning, everybody. Yeah, this is, as Bobby said, it's amazing, and Jerry said, amazing season, and stop playing church. So what I believe the Lord tells us in this time, and there are things that we need to realize, God instructed you to rule and reign. And this is a time and season that you need to ask yourself, have I taken ownership of what God has given me? Am I treasuring what he's given me. You see, you, you need to take possession. And you're not going to take possession if you are not madly in love with him, radical in love with him. If you're not going to realize the privilege and the honor that he appointed you, he trusted you with his creation. But he also equipped you Because he filled you with his fullness. So there's nothing you lack. There's nothing you lack. So we've actually got no excuse because his fullness is inside of you. And you cannot treasure something. You cannot ruin something. If you have brought it into your heart. If you have not taken ownership of it you see in taking ownership of creation of what God has given is a act of love it's an act of honor so you live the way you rule the way you reign the way you glorify Yahweh is a act of love 
So we can speak a lot and say a lot of things about love. But does our lifestyle show true love? Because your lifestyle, the way that you've taken ownership, is an act of true love. You see, and the world is in chaos, and this is the most glorious time. It's the best time to reveal Him. It's an amazing time to reveal Him. And we need people, and that Spurum thing, we need people that are willing to be the Mordecais. Mordecai sat at the gate, he gave information to Esther. So without Mordecai, Esther could have not stepped into that position, stand in front of the king. And that is why a servant of God, servanthood, kingship, leadership cannot be fulfilled unless you are a servant as well and unless you've got humility. And we need to become the Mordecais for the Esthers as well. And we need to do what Esther has done she took ownership of a nation. She treasured what God treasures. And I want to tell you, God does not just treasure Israel. He does not just treasure America. He treasures all of creation. My question to you is, are you treasuring all of creation? Have you brought it into your heart? And this is a time and season even more than ever that we need to engage and encounter the seven spirits of God. We can't walk without it. You need to know the seven spirits of God is a gift from Him. It's an extension of Him that's available to you each and every second. And you can hear the voice, you can see the faces. They teach us, they help us to step into maturity. To represent God as mature sons of God. That God can declare same what he declared over Jesus said. This is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. And then he goes further and said, listen to him. And this is a time that the world darkness has to rise up and say, these are beloved sons and daughters of Yahweh. Listen to them. This is amazing and season for all of us and the question is what are you going to do about it stop waiting on the Lord don't use that as an excuse he's done everything he's given you everything that you need stop waiting on the church stop waiting on some other leader or other body. what are you doing because God created you for the purpose of his will to glorify him so what are you doing about that? So it's time to become radical and bring the, the, the world into what Bobby saw, said, awestruck, awe and amazement. Yeah. Awe and amazement will fill this world. Are you going to be the key, the gateway for those people? I bless you. Just for interest like here in the green room, and I, Hetty and I spoke about it a lot, there's a painting that says, are you ready to fly? And when he said, put your phones on airport mode, the Lord said, it's a season to fly. It's a season of the greater glory, and it's time that my sons realize that they are unlimited supernatural multi-dimensional beings and now it's a season to fly in the glory of Yahweh yeah it reminded me of when you said that a dream I had not too long ago about a plane that I was on is really big plane there was no pilot of course I knew the pilot was really the Lord or Holy Spirit but every person that came on that airplane 
they came on only like with the clothes they were wearing. They had no handbag, no luggage. The men, they didn't even have a wallet. They just came as I am. See, they brought no baggage with them. Okay? We're in a season we can't keep carrying the past with us. We've got to go forward without the past. Okay? Bobby, what, what do you say about that? Uh, in one of the airports, there's a, a big stack of luggage, remember? And uh, I did a uh, video there because uh, that's what the church is, and we got uh, way too much baggage. And we, we've got to learn how to cast all of our care upon the, the Lord. And don't you, don't you want to do that? Uh, I'll tell a Bob Jones story if it's okay. Uh, we invited Bob down to Texas to do a meeting with us, so I go to pick him up at the airport, and he had one little duffel bag, just, I mean, a little bitty thing like that. I said, uh, where's your luggage? He said, I got it. I said, no, where's your luggage? He goes, no, I got it. I mean, a little, you know, and, uh, and when I go somewhere, I, I need a, a trailer truck nearly, you know, but, but, but I thought, that's traveling light, isn't it? But uh, that, that was pretty amazing. I want you to understand something. The devil wants to wear you out when you're toting your baggage. Here's what we got to learn to do. Cast all of our care upon him. Now, it's okay to come to the altar, pour out your burdens, but don't pick your burdens back up. It says casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. And you will find what? Rest for your souls. Now, the devil wants to wear you out. And he wants you to be emotionally drained. But God wants us to renew our strength. How do you do it? I say 40, 28 through 31. They that what? Wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with what? Wings as of eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and what? Not collapse and faint. Listen, in him is everything we need. So that's our destiny is get in him and let him get in us. And I, here's my goal. I want to become so much like Jesus, the devil can't tell whether it's Bobby or Jesus. That, that, that's a possibility in the Bible. Isn't that something? But anyway, don't ever underestimate uh, that God wants to use you and how he wants to use you. He can use you to raise the dead. He can use you to speak words that will change people's lives. And like, like we've said earlier, he gets the glory. He gets the glory. I'm telling you, I told you this last night or night before last, whenever it was, the highest form of treason for ministry is to take the gifts God gives us to win the people to Christ and use that gift to win the people to ourselves. The Lord said that's the highest form of treason. And I'll tell you what, we have got to make sure we're putting Jesus out there first. And don't, don't you want to see people come to know him in the fullness? It is absolutely wonderful. I'm amazed. It's the most crucial time in human history. And look who God's let live. That's pretty stunning, don't you think? He could have chosen anybody to live in this time, but he chose us. And so we got to we got to shake ourselves and rise to the occasion. We got to let our light so shine that men may say our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And I like it when they go, "How do you do what you do?" I do it through superhuman energy. That's in the Bible. Colossians 1:29. Paul said, "I I was grown weary trying to get the people of God to maturity." And then he said, "But then I do it through super, say super, superhuman energy. It's available to us." If we'll tune in to him. Thank you, Bobby. Okay. Are you ready for Q&A time? Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Jerry has the microphone. Here's the instructions. If you have a question for one of us or all of us, it has to be one question. Okay. And one question because I can't remember, you know, past one. But one question, and not personal history or all of this stuff, and don't ask for a personal prophecy because you're not going to get it. So one question that you would like answered by someone or everyone on the panel. How's that? And you'll come to Jerry. He'll hold the microphone. And you ask the question, and we'll give you an answer. How's that? Simple. Okay. Is anybody fear, fearful, dreadful? <laughs> Come, come, come up to Jerry. I'm not running the whole room. <laughs> you, you, can, you can form a little line here. Jerry, tell them where to stand, though. You stand right here. It's not going to be in front of the camera? Back this way. Okay. Come on. 
I'd like to ask, what is the most supernatural experience you ever had with Jesus? <laughs> well, he came and knocked on, my, on the door and stepped in with a bottle in his hand and said, we're going to have a christening service, but you don't know anything about, you don't know anything about christening. And he walked in the bedroom, hit the bottle uh, in the, on the wall, broke the bottle, and all is running down the, the wall just like that. And the Lord said, uh, it, it turned into a map of the world, and he said, you can only target what I target or you'll become a target. But a visitation from Jesus is pretty shocking, don't you think? And he wants to make himself known to you. And uh, I'm telling you, uh, any, anything you find in the Bible, it can be yours. Deuteronomy 29, 29 said, the secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our descendants from now on. So if you find something in the Bible, uh, it, it's revealed, isn't it? And it can become yours. Paul was caught up in the third heaven. If God caught Paul up in the third heaven, he can catch Bobby up in the third heaven. You understand that? Well, that's why we've got to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not have to be ashamed. We've got to find out whatever happened then can happen for us. Paul said, I know a man who was caught up and saw things he wasn't even supposed to talk about. Now, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, a visitation from Jesus. Uh, all of us should seek that. We should position ourselves in a way that we can say, Lord, speak. And God gives us a, a pathway to it. Psalm 1611 said, you will show me the pathway of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. So we've got to make sure we're on the right pathway. How do we do it? You will show me the pathway of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. Yeah, okay. Well, and I've had, uh, the Lord came to me and here's what he said. He said, what are your plans for moving the church from simply surviving to divinely thriving? That's what he said, just like that. What are your plans for moving the church from simply surviving to divinely thriving? And I go, um, um, uh, I'm not quite sure I have one. That's what I thought. And then out of my mouth came these words. My plan is to wait before Almighty God till he reveals his plan to me. And then by the grace of God, I'm going to do his all within me to accomplish what he's set before me to do. And the angels all said, good answer. <laughs> you, you want to share something? Well, you said the most. Okay. Um, December 18th, 2001. The Lord told me, because I was in school and ministry at that time, the Lord said, I'm coming for you tonight. I didn't know what that meant. But he had me in a, a time of fasting and prayer where I had to cover my mirrors, my windows. I mean, I had bad hair day for 10 days because I couldn't even look in my own mirror. <laughs> but he said, I'm coming for you tonight. He said, I'm the only voice that you will hear and the only face that you will see, and I'm taking you up the mountain. I wasn't sure what that meant either. But that night, and I don't know what time it was, I know my body was in bed, but it's like he literally like sucked me up out of my body, and we were gone. Now, I had seen, like, it looked like the whole universe opened up. You know, it's like my ceiling opened up, and, and this, well, this light had come out. It reminded me of, like, the um, northern lights, and that's how the voice came to me. He said, are you ready? And then I was gone. So I only knew one place that I was. Okay, but we moved very quickly. Now, how long I was gone and what all I saw, I don't know. But and what time I was came back into my body. I laid there as if I was dead. And the only thing, for the days that I was in this time of fasting and prayer... And not seeing anybody or talking to anybody, I had things that he would give me. I taped it. I wrote it real big and taped it on the wall. So what I did then, like I said, I laid as if I was dead. I couldn't move anything but my eyeballs. But I would read what I had written to strengthen myself. I said, Lord, what is wrong with me? I thought I had a stroke or something. I didn't know. But I said, Lord, what is wrong with me? He said, this is what it would be like if I removed my presence. You'd be like a dead man. So, so I continued to just, you know, read the scripture and what he had said and tried to strengthen myself. 
But he did tell me this, that everything he showed me, he, what he showed me, what I remember was my hometown. Because I could see the, the, um, the government building with the clock tower and the angels blowing the trumpets. That's what I could see. And nothing else did I remember. He said, I showed you the rest of your life. And he said, you won't remember it, but you will walk it out. And he showed me that so I would not get off the path as I completed the rest of my life. Okay? So God is good. And he, of course, he made me. He knows I'm not that smart. I'd probably go someplace else. Right? So you were part of that journey that he had me on that day. Right? But that was the most, like, supernatural thing I, I give no justice to what I say, the, the light, how that light came and the voice that, whoo, out of it like that. Are you ready? <laughs> you aren't ready for an experience like that. Yeah. I think definitely the most special is when he appears to you in the natural. I was saved for the first time for seven days and Jesus walked into our room. And my wife, I jumped off my bed and I saw I was sleeping just after midnight. I just got baptized that day. And he walked and I've woken up with a presence and right in front of my bed, he stood with his hands stretched out and you could just see it was like fire. I can't describe it. Fire, glory coming out of his hands. And it penetrated myself and my wife and we both got transfigured and he just smiled and said I bless you with my fullness and he stood there for a while and just gone that changes your life forever that brings awe and amazement that brings fear of the Lord and I had numerous or not numerous sounds a lot I had some other encounters in places all over the world that he walked into my room and started speaking to you that's amazing being translated, transported, transfigured. Um, I've had times that I wake up in the morning and I'll tell my wife, I've been away to this town and this town and this nation last night and many different places. And she'll say, yeah, but your body has been here. I said, yes. And we get phone calls from those places and nations. Is that Pastor Etienne's house? Yes. Please thank him for being here last night. We are healed. We are saved. Um, I've seen so many miracles, praying for people, a guy that had no eyeballs, nothing, empty sockets. And the Lord said, just tell him, close your eyes and just say, creative miracle. And when you open up your eyes again, a guy stands there with a smile with two new eyes in his head. Things like that. You need to realize you are instrument of the impossible. And the whole thing is you can have that lifestyle. It's, it's available to all of us. You need to realize it's for you. It's not just for some. But the key is you need to seek him and his face. You gaze upon his face all the time. Don't go to him because you want encounters and experiences. Go to him because he's your first love. And out of that, everything happens naturally. I don't have to ask, Lord, I want to get translated. Lord, I want to go to heaven. It's a natural manifestation if he's your first love and he's everything in your life. Your biggest desire must always be, I, my biggest desire is, I want to reveal him to the people as he is in heaven, in spirit and truth. And you and I need to realize he has given us that ability to reveal him in his fullness. But do you love him like that? Um, my name is Michelle, and I just want to thank you, all of you, um, for doing this conference. Uh, this question is for all of you. So I know you mentioned, Etienne, that we can rule and reign with angels. And I've heard uh, with other uh, preachers and um, other people that we can't command angels. So I'm, I'm wondering how can we rule and reign with them if we can't command them? And then uh, if in your examples, if you have ruled and reigned with them and commanded them, show me examples in the scripture and how you've done it so that we can learn. Because I'd want to know about that. Okay. 
For sure you can instruct angels. The word, the people took the word and there's one scripture that says, and God commanded the angels over you. And man has made that a law, said we can't. It doesn't say only God, no way. So if you go to the New Testament, you go to Hebrews and everything it says, once you were lower than angels, now you're higher. Everything in creation is submitted under you. So what do you do? I command angels according to God's will. They will only respond if it's God's will. So what do I do for myself to show honor and reverence to God? I always say, Lord, I command the hunter angels, for example, to go and hunt down and arrest all the powers of darkness coming against me. I command the warrior angels right now to resist the works of the devil. I command the destroying angels to go and destroy all the powers of darkness. Because you are a king it says in Ephesians and you will teach and sh- the angels the glory of God and show them the glory so they under you they a gift from God to help you to rule and reign to assist you but I always tell the people make sure it's according to God's way and make sure your heart is not about yourself it's about glorifying him that is what I do a lot of times. I can give you people give, and that I've trained and equipped. They will give you many testimonies in work circumstance. You've got a difficult meeting tomorrow at work. So I command the angels of peace, of love, of truth, of worship, of glory to go into that venue, in that office, to prepare the way, the atmosphere. When that difficult person walks in, that he'll encounter Yahweh, that he comes into peace. And you must hear the testimonies. So that is how you do, but everything makes sure it's according to his will and his purpose. I'm just going to read this scripture, uh, Psalms 103, 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel him in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. So, you see, it's his word. That's what, what Etienne was saying. Like we pray for somebody, or, you know, the angels do his word. It's not, it's not Bonnie's word. You know, you honor God and you give the command, but they do his word. And like he said also, it has to be the Lord's will. You're not just sending them on assignment because it's what you want to do. Okay, so it's with his authority. Yeah, um, we need a new appreciation of heavenly hosts and angels. They're on our side, thank the Lord. Most of us in this room and those watching would be dead or mangled if it was not for angelic involvement. Psalms 91 11 says the angels of God encircle around about us. And it's a military term. They set up a perimeter. And aren't you glad? And they're for us. They really are for us. And it's like the guys have said here, uh, you can't just come up with some uh, idea and go, I command you to do this. Uh, I'll tell you, if you see the power, these angels have, have great power. And But the Bible says, what? Don't you understand one day you'll judge the angels? Yeah. Now, I'm telling you, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? But angels are for us, and I'm so glad. I wrote a book about it. I'm, uh, I wrote a book about heaven's host of faithful and the fallen. And I put it all down. And I, I'm driving down the road one time. The Lord appeared to about from here to Bonnie and goes, I told you to write a book about the faithful and the fallen. I said, I did. He said, you did real good on the faithful, but you skipped over the fallen. And so I was going to justify myself. That's ignorant. I was going to justify myself. And so I said to the Lord, well, you know, I didn't want to give the devil a lot of uh, notoriety. Ooh, he wheeled her and said, you know my word. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning the devil and his devices. And he said, you know my word. And he said, the only way to keep the body of Christ from being ignorant is to teach them. So I had to rewrite the heaven's host book. And put in there about the devil. Uh, now, when you see the devil, he won't have horns. He won't have hooves. He'll look like a Spanish prince. He'll be so eloquent in his talk. It's amazing. But I'm telling you what, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And these angels are on our side. Now, I've seen the warring angels. They're taller in this building. They're fierce. I mean, now, uh, I, I can tell you what not to do. Don't. They can hear your thoughts just like you're talking. 
So the the warring angels came and they're all in line like this, like like old Sears, and their their eyes are glazed like this. And I thought to myself, I believe they're standing too far apart. And these angels, warring angels, all in sequel, looked at me like, "Who are you, worm?" <laughs> to tell us. And here's what happened. You ready? I thought it. I thought I think I think they're standing too far apart. And they they go. Whoa! And threw out their wings. And one wing touched the other wing. And underneath their wings was pinions of light and sharp as a razor. And he said, these warring angels are going to come down during these days and cut away through the darkness and make a way for us through the darkness. So these angels know what they're doing. And they're real. Every one of us have an angel looks just like us according to the Bible. Remember, they, uh, Peter knocked on the door and they go, nope, it must be his angel. Yeah. And I'm telling you, God assigns angels to us. I think sometimes mine are going, tag me out, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but listen, I, I'm telling you, they're really real. They're mentioned, what, 730 something times in the New Testament? Isn't that amazing? So uh, we welcome angels. They're really, really on our side. You can hear them. And you be careful. The Bible said, be careful. Be careful how you treat strangers. Some have entertained angels unaware. And so ask God to make you keenly aware of the supernatural. And I'll tell you what, uh, you, you can smell angels. You can smell demons. And so it's, uh, I, want to, I want our senses to be attuned to the spirit realm too, don't you? And uh, somebody asked a while ago about one of the most supernatural moments. I would preached on the cross hundreds of times. The cross, the crucifixion. I'm sitting at my desk with an open Bible and a clean uh, uh, notepad. And I'm going to be preparing notes to preach about the cross. So I'm pulling myself a little bit closer to the desk. And I made the slightest little prayer. Here's what I mumbled out of my mouth. Lord, please make this more than mere words. When I said that out of my lips, I was jerked up from my office, translated back 2,000 years in history, and I'm on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, and here comes a mob, and the mob is coming because Jesus is bearing his cross. Jesus walked from here to this seat for me, right there, and he looked at me, and my mind was working, I'm going, ah, this can't happen, I was in an office, and now I'm over here, and the Lord looked at me, and when his eyes met my eyes, all the strength in my body left, and I fell, wham, and hit the cobblestones, and I get up and go to the cross with Christ. See, this is before Mel Gibson made his movie, The Passion of the Christ. Church, he's bought, I wrote a little book about the experience, the cross. Take you five minutes to read it, a whole lifetime to get over it. I'm telling you, I went to the cross with Christ. Mel Gibson couldn't capture the smells Clotted blood, demons whirling around, strong bulls have encompassed. Listen, uh, uh, Jesus didn't die from a spear in the side. He didn't die from suffocation. Jesus died of a broken heart. He says, Ma, okay, oh man, I, I can hear it while I'm sitting here. He cried out, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? First time, only time, you'll find Jesus referring to Father in any other term than Father. See why he's dying as a sinner now, not a son. Oh, man, he died of a broken heart. It says in Psalms 22, my heart is melted within me. When we survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, listen, it ought to, it, it ought to just take away all pride and arrogance. What a God we have. That he so loved us, he gave his son to. And it says, we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as gold and silver, but with what? The precious blood of Christ. I dare you to try to look it up in the Hebrew. The word precious there, we don't even have a word for it. Here's the nearest word we've got for it. Incalculable. Means it's so valuable, so precious, so unique. There's no way to put a value on it. So angels are real. What Jesus did for us is real. And I want us to really have a reality check. It says in the book of Romans, that knowing what a critical hour this is, how it is high time now for us to wake up out of slumber, rouse to reality. Write that on your mirror. Rouse to reality. If any group on the planet needs a reality check, it's the church. We need a reality check. 
And it says in Romans, arise and to and, and uh, have a reality check. Okay. Next. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for uh, just coming. And thank you, Bonnie, for putting this uh, conference on. It's been amazing. Uh, I'd also like to just thank you for the love and the care that you extended to Bob Jones, extending his life while he was here on earth. And uh, as Bobby mentioned yesterday, he had an encounter with Bob shortly after he had gone to be with the Lord. And uh, some of us know that he's still very active in the cloud of witnesses. And uh, a few, mo- few minutes back, there was some interference that was happening with these microphones. And the uh, Lord showed me, had, gave me a vision of you holding that mic today, today, actually. And my question to you, Bonnie, is if you can, read the three and only three numbers that are on that microphone and share whatever the Lord feels, whatever, the, whatever you feel led to share with, the, with us here. Bobby can share, at the end can share as well. Well, thank you, Todd. The number is 341. <laughs> so, okay, so that was Bob's number from back in 1981 when, well, there's a whole, well, I had a little book out here, but it's gone. Um, but Bob had an encounter with the Lord, and the, it's like the Lord came to him dressed in a tuxedo, at, had him at a banqueting table, had his plate, he had him turn it over, and on the bottom side of that, uh, plate was a blank check signed in the blood of Jesus, okay? But the number on it was 341. And so he told Bob it would be a signpost. And it really encouraged Bob's faith, but he said to use that. And when he went somewhere, you know, he would know that, like, the Lord would be with him and he could look for, you know, like the miraculous things to happen. So Bob, there's much more to it, but Bob looked for that every place he went. And, of course, he and I got married in 2006. In uh, 08, we were planning for 8808 at Morningstar. And Brother Bishop uh, Larry Jackson was there, and he was teaching on the Jamatra. And he said 888 means Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, he went on with a a really awesome teaching. And then he came back and sat down, and Bob said, Brother, do you know what 341 means? And he said, Oh, yes. It was six things. Healing, a holy convocation, ask, petition, teach, and prosperity. So all those years in between 81 and 2008, Bob, you know, lived by his faith in that, you know, looking for a signpost by that number, and uh, Bob really said, you know, it indicates the time and season that we would be walking in the greater works. You know, it's a time not only the Elijah, but the Elisha ministry coming forth. So it's the power gifts and the greater works that we are to, work, to walk in. But those things, you know, Bob, I think Bob, and you probably was part of that too, um, Rick Joyner, they would say, is that like three for one? Are you getting a three for one or three for one equals eight, you know, new beginnings. So, you know, Bob lived by faith, looking for that and looking for signs and, you know, where he would go to minister. But now, since that time, we know that it means those eight or six things. So healing, holy convocation, ask, petition, teach, and prosperity. God wants us to prosper in all things. Okay, not just money. We think about prosperity as being money, but all things, especially spiritually, you know. And I I asked the Lord, I said, what's the difference between ask and petition? So he woke me one night to tell me, asking is prayer. And we need to be prayerful. And we, we do. We're asking the Lord different things in prayer. But he said, petition is coming into my presence where the enemy has no jurisdiction, no authority, but I render the judgment there. So I think we need to be taking our petitions, not just coming asking him for things, right, but bringing our petitions before the Lord, okay? It may not be the answer. He may not answer it, render the judgment, so to speak, the way you think it should be. Because you know why he gave me that? Because I was really wanting him to deal with somebody (laughs) 
it caused me a lot of problems. I, I thought, well, Lord, do it this way. Just smite him, you know. <laughs> but you know what the Lord said to me? No, you love him. I'm like, you got to be kidding, right? Are, are you, okay, I know. Sometimes we do. We just say to the Lord, he's, he's our best friend. I'm his best friend, right? Yeah. But I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I'm going to love this person? <laughs> yes. So, anyhow, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Hi, my name is Joy. Um, I, my question is, why is it that it seemed like the church don't understand how we haven't been able to walk in love? And I ask that because um, there's some things that happen in the race, and I'm not saying that's the only way that we don't walk in love, but I remember being at one church and People didn't like me because of my color, and I knew it. And it wasn't just a few people, and, and some people wanted me to stay there. And I said, no, I am not going to commune with that, with that spirit. And there's big churches, old churches, but I know two big churches. You all would know them if I called the names. When I went there, I seen infighting between the worship people. And um, so... I know, and I'm not going to go on long, but I know we need to be healed, we need to grow, and we need to do some other things. Believe God, walk by faith, all of that. And that's been told to us. But why is it that the church seemed like we're not able to truly be examples and walk in love? Biggest problem is God is not their first love. If he is not your first love, you will never learn or be love yourself. And that is the biggest problem. How many of us, and that includes all of us here, how many of us live with him as your everything, as your first love? All your decisions, everything are based on him, on the purpose of his will or what he desires. You see, and that's a problem in the church that we've got ministries, we've got jobs, instead of we suppose to be instruments of love. And every church, it starts at the top. I'm sorry to say it. What's at the top comes down. It's like a business. It's a, it's a basic principle in everything. What's at the top comes down. And I'm I'm blunt and straightforward. The problem is in the body of Christ, the leaders. Because there are not many leaders that truly walk in a face-to-face, mouth-to-mouth relationship with God out of love. So if you can't be love and learn how to love from him, you cannot release love. Because love, intimacy with God means I'm in oneness with him. He says there's no distinction, no separation between you and me. So what he actually says, perfect love is you as well. You see, when you're in oneness with him, true intimacy and relationship, it means his eyes becomes yours. His mouth, his voice, you are the extension of him You're on the earth. you the voice from behind the veil coming. You're from the throne. You're the extension. You're the extension of perfect love. So it all comes to is God needs to be restored as first love in the church and especially in the leader's lives. I'll make this real brief. Thank you, Etienne. When I was living in Alaska and the Lord was asking me what I wanted in a husband, and I said, well, I don't want one. And he asked me again. I said, I don't want one. I thought he was hard of hearing. And each time he said that, it felt like he had his hand on my chest and pressing harder. So he said, make me a list what you want in a husband. <laughs> well, I didn't want one. But, but, the, <laughs> but the list was, and this was exactly how it went, he had to love God above all things. He had to already be established in ministry. He had to know more than me so he could teach me. Uh, He couldn't intimidate me. I couldn't intimidate him. We would minister together, and in all things we did, it would be to glorify the Lord. 
Okay, and I signed my name to that list and I threw it across the table. I'm like, there you go. And I would put on my old thick, you know, shoes that you have to wear in Alaska, walk in the ice. And I went out because I had to get over that. But you see, then like six months later, or probably about eight months later is when I met Bob. And I will say this, he met all, because I said to the Lord then, you'll never meet any, you'll never feel that. There's nobody like that. Well, yeah, there was. But, but that was exactly it. Bob did love God above all, all, period. That was it, you know. And, and he did meet all those other qualifications. But, uh, but he did. He loved God above all things. And that's the perfect picture. Why, the problem in the church is we don't know, you know, God is love, and Jesus is a person named Love, and we have not put him at the head, at the head of the church, you know, and first in our life. So that's my story. Good. Hey, how did Bob propose to you? Oh. Here it is. They pulled up to a red light, and he goes, hey, you want to get hitched? Now, it, 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 if that's not romantic, I've never heard of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, you want to get hitched? Yeah. Oh, boy. But like, like it's already been said, uh, Bonnie was used to extend his life, and um, I'm so thankful for that. Uh, Bob, he's very, very unique. And I'm telling you, uh, uh, God wants to make all of us unique. He wants us to really fall in love new and fresh and deep with the Holy Ghost and with Jesus. Just let Jesus be king in your whole life. But anyway, uh, Bob's 341. Uh, we were out there in Albany, Oregon. And uh, Denny Klein, the pastor, we'd gone to. And Bob and Miss Fowler was asleep in the back seat. And I'm telling uh, Denny Klein, the pastor there, about Bob's 341. And as I'm telling it, he starts around a big old truck, a 18 wheel truck. And on the, on the truck in letters as tall as I am was three, four, one. And I, and old Denny goes, good luck in there. I go, yeah, isn't that some Bob and Vowels asleep in the back. And so, uh, on down the road, they wake up and, uh, they needed to go to the rest stop. So Denny turns into a rest stop and they come back in the car and they sit back in the car and we start to pull out on the freeway. And I said, Hey, Bob. I was just telling Denny about your 341. And as we're pulling out on a freeway, a big old 18 wheel goes, dark, dark, and it was 341. And Bob goes, yeah, shows up all the time. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like to run us over with a big old truck with 341 on it. But we need to look for uh, signs that God is giving us, don't you think? And I'm telling you, uh, signs and wonders. God does the sign and we do the wondering. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Just the thing about love as well. For myself, what I do, how to test myself, I need when I'm in conversations and meetings, whatever I am, after the meeting, I ask myself, I sit with myself with the Lord, if he was here in the physical, in the natural, would I have done the same, said the same, reacted the same, had the same body language? And that is a good measure how you test yourself. Did I reveal love? Did I reveal the truth? What, what would have changed if he was here in the natural? Just ask yourself, what would have changed right now if he stood here in the natural? So what's the difference? There's no difference. He's here. That is so important. And what Bobby just said about the voice of God and everything, a lover of God, a first love, and when we realize who God is, you expect it to hear God's voice through everything, through the walls, through the flags, through the lights. He spoke through donkeys and everything, said the stones will worship you. A lover of God, if you're walking in true love, is I try to invoke the voice of God through everything. I'm expecting my first love to speak to me through everything. And that's why we miss his voice so many times because we look at a one-dimensional way. He speaks to me in this way and we always say I'm waiting on the Lord. He has spoken in so many different ways in nature. So change your mindset, change your pathway of thinking. Be expectant of his voice to speak through anything. He never stops speaking, believe me. Hi, 
Uh, my name is John Ru, and uh, this coming April 8th, we can see the total solar eclipse in the United States. So I think it's a, also a sign or a warning from the Lord. And do you have any opinion or do you have any message for America recently because of this? The Bible said the heavens declare his glory. And uh, we need to understand that uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ should eclipse everything in our life. You know, he ought to cover everything in our life. And so the heavens declare his glory. And uh, I'm telling you, we need to understand the times and the season we're in. Uh, it, it, there's gross darkness around that. You know, arise, shine, for your light has come. Deep, dense darkness will cover the nations, but the Lord's light will shine upon you. There's a, ver there's a lot of verses in the Bible, but here's one. Oh, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. He said, I am, and I'm bringing fire. And it says his fire will burn up the underbrush. The underbrush means things that are in your pathway that are, are uh, keeping you from really progressing like you need to. Oh, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. He said, I am. And we're going to, we're going to get a new appreciation for the presence of God in our life. I'll tell you, we ought to be walking as such an anointing. People go, what is this? You know, we ought to walk into a room, the whole atmosphere of the room change. Because we're what? Sons and daughters of the Most High God. And listen, isn't that amazing? And we have not because we ask not. I'll give you a verse. I'll give it to you in Texican. That's what I speak. Here it is. Make up your mind what you want. Tell God what that is, and he'll get it for you. Is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. Job twenty two twenty eight. And you shall decide a thing. Make up your mind. Then you decree what you've decided, and the Lord will establish it, and the light of his favor will shine on your pathway. Now, we don't have it because we don't ask for it sometimes. You have not because you... We've got to start decreeing what we want to happen. And, and watch, you, there's power in your words. And I'm telling you, if you decree a thing and it shall be established for you and the light of God's favor will shine upon your pathway. I like his favor, don't you? Uh, we need to learn how to bask in the favor of God. Oh, it, so, it says this in Psalms 30 verse 5. It says, weeping may last the night, but joy comes in the morning. And it says, God's anger is but for a tiny moment. His favor is for a complete lifetime. So let's look at the favor of God, okay? You know, the Holy Cliffs is, I believe what the Lord showed me, it's a realigning of creation to come into his time, to come into his glory, to come into his sound frequency and vibration. I want to make it clear. It's not just for America. God speaks when he does something. He speaks to all of creation. Man has taken it and blocked God, put it in a little box. We went totally out of proportion. Let me make it clear. Nineveh. All the Ninevehs in America, great. But it only influences two. So we just presume now this is all about Nineveh. What God is doing is realigning creation back into his will, his purpose. Because man needs to rule and reign with creation. God sees everything in oneness. Everything has influence on everything. And I shared it at the conference that scientists have proven just by man sitting on the earth and walking the earth, it influences the rotation of the planets. That's your influence. And it's time that man makes use of creation to glorify the king. You had Joshua who instructed the sun, the moon, the stars to stand still to overcome darkness. You had Elijah commanding fire to come down. And so Job tells you, if you told the people, go and ask the stars for the answer. You see? And is Job a new age? For sure not. You see, but Job knew creation 
You knew God's will. So this is a realigning creation. This is a, 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 a voice of Yahweh speaking to us. Said, Make use of what I've given to you. You suppose to bring everything in alignment. To come into harmony, into oneness. To glorify me. So he's realigning all of creation. We need to move on a little bit. Hello, thank you. This question is actually for Etienne. Um, I know that you've received messages from God that actually save people's lives. And I'm just wondering uh, how you started hearing from God and how you learned to receive specific messages from God like that. Okay, I got radically saved from one day being a total drunk into the next day of resigning my job going into full-time ministry. Her hearing the audible voice of God. And that day that I got saved, I walked the street and the Lord told me there are three things that you will never give up and do every day. You will love me as first love. You will be a radical obedient. Bobby calls it swift obedience. And you will never compromise. Then I started spending 10, 12 hours a day in the word. I praise and worship through the nights, just sitting still to Ye's voice because I need to glorify my lover. And the key is you need to realize who appointed you. You're appointed not by man, by him. You need to realize the privilege and the honor to represent him. That's an, such an honor, and you need to take ownership of what is given you. So then, and I spend a lot of time in meditation, being still to hear his voice. You see, you, you, you need to exercise your spiritual senses, that you're in the awareness of him all the time. And exercising your spiritual senses is an act of love because that shows the Lord, I want to be aware of him all the time because I want to reveal him as he is in heaven. So that is what you need to do. Listen to his voice. Go first in all circumstances. Go firstly to him before you go to the world, before you go to Google. Go to him. You see, and that's where it's in. We need to learn how to be still. That is the thing. And realize he doesn't just speak in one way. He speaks in multidimensional ways. He speaks by smelling, by tasting. Everything is speak through nature. I've got Bobby. I know Bobby as well. And there's my wife. I feed hundreds, thousands of birds to the, and, and every day. They give me messages. I've had dogs giving me messages. Horses giving me messages. Trees speaking to me. The earth speaking to me. Voices. God's voice through them. You see, and that's what you need to be so intentional every day. To, and, and desiring. It needs to be a passion. I can't wait to hear his voice. I always tell the story of when I was at school. We didn't have mobile phones, obviously, in those years. Um, you had the hand lines. You had to, and then you had school. You're a little boy, and you love this girl, but you're so shy. You don't want to tell her. So you find out what her home number is, and you dial the number, and then you and the other side, for example, hi, this head here, oh, and you smash the phone down, I've heard a voice, wow. <laughs> the question is, have you got that same passion for Yahweh? Because that's what you do for first love. Hi, um, thank you for everything this weekend. My, my name is Arnold, and um, the scripture speaks about except the grain or wheat fall to the ground and die, it remains alone and to bear much fruit. Um, what I was asking is, um, you know, oftentimes in life you feel like you have actually done that or died only to later on find out that there things grow, more growth. So I thought it was like a one-time event, like when you give a life to Christ. And then it, it, it seems like the um, goalpost is moved because um, God requires more. So is it a one-time event or is it an extended life type? 
continual growth is what God's looking for. He wants us to continue and mature and become uh, more Christ-like. That's our ultimate goal is to become more like the master. And uh, one of the things that uh, we need to look at is the fruit. That's absolutely wonderful. We're going to bear fruit in due season. But sometimes the church needs to deal with the root. You know, uh, if you just deal with the fruit, that's going to be every season. If you'll deal with the root, it's a one-time deal. You know, so let's make sure we're rooted and grounded in Him and the Word and let the Word be uh, our, our base. He says, no firmer foundation can any man lay than that which is laying in Christ. Now, uh, you asked me a moment ago if I had anything. Uh, on uh, YouTube right now, there's a message I went and preached in Bethel called Recalibration. The body of Christ is stepping into uh, these days a recalibration. So I said, Lord, what does recalibration mean? And it means returning back to the original point of accuracy. That's military people. It's returning back to the original point of accuracy. And that's what we got to do. We got to get back to the word. And we got to be doers of the word and not just mere hearers. And we got to activate, let the word of God activate us into action. And, uh, uh, Listen, God is tired of us being on the sidelines as spectators. He wants us on the front line as participators. Okay? And so I want you to give Joshua 1, 9. I want you to be bold and brave and very courageous and go do what God has commissioned you to do. You're, you're the salt of the earth. And now, I, I detest this verse. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its ability to function, it is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. I don't want ever to be called a good for nothing Christian, do you? I want us to maintain our function as salt and light. Now, I'm telling you, salt purifies. It gives uh, uh, different flavors. But listen. I want us all to deal with the root inside of us. And you say, well, I'm okay. Ah, well, no, we're not capable of accessing and looking at our own self. David said, search me, O God, and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in a way that's eternal and everlasting. We've got to get serious about our walk with God. Come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I will be your God and you will be my sons and daughters, declares the Lord God Almighty. We have got to clean up our act, don't you think? We got to be pure and clean if we're going to get into his presence. Don't you love the Bible? It never presents a question without releasing an answer. Sociology raises a pile of questions and no answer. Here's a, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. See, it tells us who's going to go there and how to get there. So ask him to search you and try you. You say, well, I'm okay. No, we're incapable of that. And we have to ask God, search me, oh God, and try me. Reveal myself to myself. All right. Anything else? Recalibration. We've got to get back to the original point of accuracy, and that's the word of God in it. I love it. It says, forever, O oh God. Thy word is settled in heaven. Aren't you glad we don't have to come out with a new revision? I'm sorry, that's old antiquated. No, the flowers fade, the grass withers, but the word of God will what? Stand forever. It does not have to be revised. We have two more questions. Okay. Hi, Hi my name's Camelia. Um, my question's in regards to healing. There's obviously multiple scriptures on healing and God's ability to do that. Um, and with that, um, there's times where you see that people aren't healed. And I wondered if you all have any perspective, perspective to encourage people to continue believing for God's ability to heal them personally, even though they may see that not occurring around them, because that can sometimes impact your ability to do that. The whole thing about healing, where I think we make it, I'm talking about my personal experience, traveling, done, seen probably close to two million healings. The key thing is when you pray, First John 5, verse 13 to 15, paraphrasing, if you pray what the Holy Spirit tells you to pray, it is done. And a lot of times we pray out of compassion and out of our soul. You need to learn, you need to know God's got a plan with everything. And that's where we do a lot of harm in the kingdom. 
I've had times that I've been asked for to come and pray for healing for a person. I arrive next to the bed and the Lord tells me, I'm coming to fetch him or her. You pray for peace and love. So I pray for peace and love. The family is furious with me, throw me out of the houses or the hospital. Then I get to the next place and the Lord's and the family, like for example, oh, I was safe probably for four weeks. Get girl, come and pray with us guys and I see you in two hours time. The doctor's going to put the machines down. So his life is finished. It's just a body lying there. So I get next to the bed. He's got pipes all over in his stomach and his mouth on, on the machines. And the Lord said, pray for healing. And I thought, what? And he said, yes. And I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I release your healing. He jumped off the bed, pulled the pipes. I said, what am I doing there? There's nothing wrong with me. Two hours later, he walked out of the hospital. You see, the whole key is to pray what the Holy Spirit tells you to pray. And not to compromise. Don't conform to the desires of the people. Obviously, we want everybody To get healed. That's a desire. And I tell you now, if God said he's healed, he is healed. But what happens now, because we are influenced by what's around us, by our desires and our emotions, we make a declaration, you are healed in the name of Jesus, it's done. And two hours later, the person dies. It does such harm to the kingdom. God's got a plan, and even in death, he gets glorified. We need to stay with that. I've seen it in ministering to millions of people. I've done huge crusades over the world. Stay what the Holy Spirit tells you to pray. You're so right about don't pray just out of your own passion. Uh, I had one of my good friends I used to bird hunt with all over the country, and uh, his wife got sick. I mean, really, really sick, and they said that she's going to die and not live. And so he called me, and he said, oh, and he was just crying, said, oh, please pray that his wife will live. And I didn't even inquire of the Lord. I just said, oh, Lord, I pray that she will live. She lived, but she lived like a vegetable. I mean, just uh, just awful, just swiveled away to nearly nothing. And then he called me and he said, uh, uh, would you pray that she would be released to go to heaven? And I did, and she died just like that. And see, uh, God wanted to carry on months before, but I prayed out of my passion for my friend and not the will of God. So when you're praying for the sick or the dying, pray, Lord, Lord I pray your perfect will be done with them. And I'm telling you what, Smith Wigglesworth, as his wife, he raised her back two or three times and she said, Smithy, don't do this again. And listen, listen, that's really true. But uh, we've got to learn to pray the will of God. Because uh, don't let your emotion get into the way. Just say, Lord, I pray your perfect will. Because his will is a lot bigger and better than ours. Jeremiah 29, 11, you remember that one? So uh, just pray according and say, Lord, I pray your perfect will be done. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, God still raises the dead, doesn't he? And so we've got to understand, uh, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But don't give up praying, but just pray, Lord, I pray your perfect will be done with them. And uh, that's pretty neat. I've been on a deathbed in December 2014. So the doctors, I was on a ventilator, everything. So numerous times, few times, the doctors called my wife and children. So we're putting off the machines. It's just a body lying there, blowing in oxygen. What did my wife do and my sons? They went and said, Lord, you released all these prophecies over Etienne. Some of these are not being fulfilled yet. So reject death. And here I am today. When God released prophecies to you, that's a weapon against death. Well, now that we've got that, I can say, you know, uh, of course, Bob passed on Valentine's Day 2014, but on his birthday, which was the 4th of February, he was in um, the emergency room, okay? And, well, back in 07, he was in the emergency room. That's what, Anyhow, at that point, you know, he, Bob coded in 2007, and I'm making a long story short, but 
I knew that Bob had not seen the fulfillment of his of his ministry to begin to see the beginning of the billion soul harvest. And even though he coded, they had paddles, they were doing this and that to revive him. I just said, you know, I said, you will live and not die. I, re- I rebuked that spirit of death and I called forth the spirit of life. I said, you let his spirit come back into his body. And I said, you will live and not die. Okay, because because I knew he had not fulfilled that promise. Now, the doctor's telling me, well, you know, they got him breathing again, but they said he's not going to make it through the night. I said, no, he will live because he hasn't seen the fulfillment of his prophecy. And I said, he already died once. The doctor didn't want to hear this, you know. He said, well, you know, whatever, and he left. So, a, like a day and a half later, now, they had Bob, you know, Bob made it through the night. They had to bring dialysis machine to his room. They had him on the ventilator and all that stuff. But he was alive. And the doctor said, I never thought that I would see him alive again. I said, told you. Because he hadn't seen his promise come. Now, fast forward to 2014. The Lord had showed me like eight months earlier that he was going to take Bob home. And... The day he was taken into the hospital, which was the fourth, Bob was laying there. He said, he said he had uh, he had double uh, lights on his eyes, and he said he was he was at the door because see he was he was ready to go home. There were two huge resurrection angels there coming to take Bob. But I said to Bob, I said, if you would go into a situation like you did in 07, where they had to put paddles on them and everything, I said, would you want them to do that or not? And he said, yes, because he did not yet fulfill what God had called him to do. Okay? Well, the ER doctor was very upset with me because he said, we want you to sign these papers so we don't have to treat him, just let him die. And I said, no. Because he said, look, your husband's hallucinating. <laughs> Bob was laying there like this. He was just real weak, but his little frail hand was going like this. He said, look, he's hallucinating. I said, no, he's not. I said, I don't know where you are spiritually or religiously, but I said, he's a prophet. He sees things in the spirit that you can't see in the natural. And I said, he's telling those angels over there to go away. And he said, What? <laughs> These were the most glorious, beautiful, huge angels with wings. I had never seen winged angels at that point. But they were coming to take Bob home, and Bob was saying, No, go away. My job is not yet complete. Okay? So, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Maybe my time is complete. <laughs> I don't know what that was. But anyhow, that doctor skirted out around, you know, and he sent in... Uh, uh, the heart doctor and then the kidney doctor, they both wanted me to sign papers just... He, he said, the one doctor said, do you know what this is going to cost Medicare? I said, no, do you? <laughs> so anyhow, I never signed the papers. Bob lived another 10 days, but and there was many things that took place with angels, etc. But, you know, Bob did complete what God had sent him to do. So it's like the guys have said, you know, we really need to hear Holy Spirit. And like Etienne said about his life, Hetty and their sons were saying, no, this is a prophecy over my husband's life. You know, you will live and not die. So, but we really need to be hearing what Holy Spirit is saying and know what direction to take. Do we release those words? Those words have power. When the doctor's standing there saying, you know, the nurse told me you can't go in his room. I said, hey, that's my husband. You don't have enough people in this hospital to keep me out, so you step aside. And she did. Okay? See, when you're married, the two become one, right? So the he of we couldn't speak, but the me of we could. So me said, (laughs) you will live and not die. So there you go. That's my story. Okay, last question here. Shalom. Uh, My question is, um, uh, as a warrior for Christ, what are the things that you should do to be trained spiritually and physically for what's coming? 
Have you ever had experiences about the war with your bride? Uh, Say it louder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is: um, Have you ever had experience of, experiences about the warrior bride and how the bride should be ready spiritually and physically for what's coming? Oh, the warrior bride, how she should be dressed, wearing, and wearing. Should be ready for. Okay. Uh, if you want to look, look in Song of Solomon. It says, who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? And uh, the Lord's getting the church to be bold and brave. And listen, it says, great is the crowd of women that publish the gospel. And so we're in a time that God really wants to show himself strong through every gender and every person. And some of the, some of the strongest uh, words I've heard come from children. Uh, I'm telling you, amazing. Bob Jones and myself were down there in Morningstar, and they were, I don't know, maybe 300 children. I mean, little bitty young kids. And I said, uh, Bob, what are we going to do? He said, oh, we're not going to do nothing. We're going to release an anointing on them, and they're going to minister. I said, okay. And they were all kind of workers that uh, were supposed to be watching over these kids. And Bob released an anointing on these kids, and they didn't know enough not to say what they saw. And they go, oh, look, frogs are jumping out of Mr. So-and-so's mouth. Unclean spirit. And look, she's got a porcupine on her back, a religious spirit. And we're going, oh, again, see? Uh, 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 except we become as a little child, we can't see her enter the kingdom. We, and, but anyway, uh, we've got to start, just say what God says and don't try to add anything to it. But these children, they, they, they could see just as clear as a bell. But they, you know, and they started declaring what they were seeing. And I thought, oh boy, uh, why didn't I see that? Because sometimes we have our own opinions and our own ideas. And so we, we need to uh, just say, God, I'll say what you asked me to say. I'll do what you asked me to do. One time I prayed for a man in our church and he fell over, clamp like that. And uh, I thought, okay. And so he was sick. And so he, he gets up and he leaned over there to me. And uh, there's a whole sea of people there. And uh, he said, well, pastor, God told me he wasn't going to heal me, but he told me the day and hour I'm going to die. What? Pastor, God said he's not going to heal me, but he's told me the day and the hour I'm going to die. And I'm going to put you under covenant that you'll be there when it happens, but you won't tell my wife. And I go, okay. So he told me the day and hour he's going to die. I wrote it on a card, put it in my desk drawer. Finally, those days came, and, you know, he was sick. But he was in his, uh, we, we were in his house there. His wife and his uh, daughter were there. And there he is in a, a, a hospital bed in his house. And so I had my card with me the day and hour he's going to die. And so I didn't want to count down five, four, three, two, one. But <laughs> that's what I was doing, honestly. And he was his hell. He was talking as lucid as anything, just, just having a great time. His wife and his daughter, uh, really, uh, they go back to, to the room to go to bed. And so I, I'm looking at the card, day and hour, and then we're five, four, and got right to the very moment that he said he's going to die. He raised up, coughed twice, fell over stone dead, and the whole room filled with angels. But I didn't believe that God would tell a guy when he was going to die. But I'll tell you, he told him. But here's the deal. He was a driller, and he drilled uh, wells and, and things like that and had a very uh, lucrative business. But his wife knew nothing about the business deal. So he lived long enough to train her so that some shysters couldn't come in and take their wealth and the, their, their job. But isn't that something? Ask God, Lord, let your will be done. And God's will sometimes is much different than ours, isn't it? Uh, I, 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 like, I like to be put on the spot sometimes. I'm in an airplane. I'm in an airplane all the time, it seems like. And uh, this guy gets up, and he's a tall guy, and he's walking by me. And the Lord said, look at him. I go, okay. And I'm looking at him. And he goes, <laughs> and fell over. <laughs> there he goes. And he's laying there. And the pilot comes on and says, is there any medics? Uh, um, there's an emergency. If they, so they're asking for medics. And so some medics came, and they got them paddles. <laughs> and they're trying to get this guy back to life. And I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm seeing there. He's purple now. And uh, it, they got his shirt unbuttoned. <laughs> and the Lord said, get up and go back there and resurrect him. So I said, okay. I get up and there's the two medics. And uh, they said, are you in the medical field? I said, sort of. That's what I said. 
I said, sort of. And they said, well, he's gone. I said, well, uh, I'm going to pray for him. So they got out of the way like, oh, this guy must be some kind of lunatic. So I put my hand on his throat, and I I said, Lord, I pray the perfect will of God be done with this man. He goes, set up and coughed. The medics went nuts. They like to burn. They they took off back to wherever they came from. But God resurrected this guy on the airplane. Now, listen, we have got to get involved in stuff. And that, I was just sitting there thinking, oh, man, that's, that's a shame, isn't it? But listen, just say, Lord, what would you have me do? And then to the best of your ability, carry out what he asks you to do. If he asks you to do it, he'll do it with you. Isn't that something? Okay. Exactly what Bob said. Only do what he tells you to do. Take on the character and the nature of whom he is. And don't engage things. What is not your portion? It means don't try and be a hero. Only do what he tells you to do. All right, children. Well, I think we're wrapping it up for the day. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who participated. You had some really good questions. I, I hope that we answered everything and beyond. So, this is really good. You know, it's neat when you have really. See, I'm the underdog here. You got two really anointed guys. That's why I wanted to sit in the middle so it, you know, overflows. <laughs> and I could pa- I can pass the mic real good. Okay. But anyhow. So who, which of you guys want to bless them before we leave? Bobby does. Okay. Bobby's the oldest. I'm glad Bobby's here because I'm usually the oldest every place I go. <laughs> that, that was always good. See, Bob was 20 years older than me, so... When I hung out with Bob, I always felt young. Now it's like, you know, I'm old and moldy. So, Bobby, here you go. All righty. So we're praying for what? Just a blessing for the people. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you are who you say you are. You do what you say you'll do. Lord, I thank you. I ask right now that you would equip us for the days that we're facing. Lord, show us that in you we are sufficient for every good work. And Lord, I release on each one of us now, Philippians 1, 13, said, I, I just want us to be like Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. I pray that the eyes of our heart will be flooded with revelatory light. We will have a grasp and a comprehension of the ways of God. We want to be who you want us to be during these days. Bold and brave, very courageous, taking a stand, doing what you've called us to do. Help us not to retreat. Help us not to back away, but push forward. Lord, we want to see thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. You said in your word, The heavens of heavens, that belongs to God. But this earth is our responsibility. So, Lord, help us to assume that responsibility and do the things we need to do so that the glory of God might fill this earth. In Jesus' name, amen.